Thank you very much for your introduction. I am Hosoya from Keio University. Now we start the first session. Speakers of this session. Actually, this session corresponds to the volume one of this uh, 20th century East Asian history. And this is on international history. And we have uh, contributors uh, for uh, this volume one who will take us the floor. The first is Dr. Shin Ichi Kitaoka, then followed by Professor Mie Oba of Kanagawa University, then last but not least, Professor Kyo Takahara of University of Tokyo. And uh, East 19, uh, 1900 to 1930 was uh, the covered by Kitaoka. And uh, then a uh, Cold War and until the end of the 20th century was covered, will be covered by two other professors. Now I would like to ask uh, Professor Kitaoka first. Kitaoka is my name. I'm the first speaker of this session. I will touch upon three issues. The origin of this webinar, a commission on Japan's goals in the 21st century. And this uh, actually, uh, this is a commission on considering the 21st century uh, from the perspective of 20th century East Asian and then the Hosoya and Mr. Nakajima patented, and Kawashima-san as well, and Takahara-san as well. It started in 2015, and of course, uh, Professor Tanaka uh, gave support. And I served as uh, uh, chairman of this commission. And uh, on top of that, uh, there was uh, this uh, Prime Minister, uh, former Prime Minister Abe's uh, commission. I thought that uh, how can we actually overcome the confrontation between the right and left uh, in uh, Jap Japan? Because some left side people feel that Japan had really awful things in Asia. But on the right side, uh, they say, no, uh, Japan did not uh, do anything wrong because it helped the development of uh, East Asia. But Japan invaded, for sure, and had a caused damage to this region, but compared to other countries' uh, colonialism, maybe what we did was not so bad. There were some reparations made after the war. So there are actually extreme views uh, in the right and left, uh, but I would like to take the middle of the road position. Well, Japan of course war and of course uh, ruled colonies, colonized countries, but as Weiss Becker raised, whether uh, Japanese have to take responsibility for what Japan did. Looking at the Japan at that time, leaders of course were responsible for what they did. But People in general, of course, uh, acquiesce that sort of uh, government. Uh, so in a way, uh, it uh, actually was responsible for what uh, Japan did. But uh, nowadays, maybe the responsibility of uh, uh, current people might not be uh, responsible for what uh, Japan did in the same manner. But one thing we should not forget about is that the invasion and the colonial rule that the Japan did have to be remembered and be studied by contemporary Japanese. And a derivative of this and the start of this uh, project was to look back uh, the 20th century East Asian history and uh, I was uh, the leader first, followed by, succeeded by uh, Dr. Tanaka. 
So we started to take uh, this uh, history of this region uh, in a comprehensive manner. And I would like to talk about the chapter I was responsible for. And uh, it was up until 1900 to 1930. And when we look at the map of 1900, Each country's uh, territory was uh, well established and stabilized. The British uh, rule of Malay was uh, just points and uh, not uh, really entire uh, territory. The same with the Netherlands uh, colony. But uh, some of the countries actually became independent, and the in border in 90, borders of the countries in 1900 have not changed that much. So actually, borders were well established in that period. And there was also uh, the Great Depression. And after that, there was a Russo-Japanese Japan uh, war, which was uh, a world uproar, which was a very serious issue. What happened after japan Russo War? All of us who study talk about the Korea, Manchuria, and so on after this war. But it is important to think what did not happen after this war. At the end, end of uh, Japan, uh, actually, Russo War, there was uh, Second, the Japan Anglo Alliance and Katsura Tafto Treaty was uh, signed. U.S. was worried that there might be a rise for uh, independence movement in the Philippines and also uh, movement in uh, India. We were borrowing a lot of money from the strong powers. So the rise of nationalism in Asia and Africa, we did not support them. We declared that we would not support them because of these loans we received from the powers. And in the First World War, France, where there was a shortage of people, actually, they actually uh, mobilized uh, everybody, even uh, the people in the colonies, because of the shortage of uh, soldiers. So japan Russell War was a major event uh, in the first half of uh, 20th century. And in the research meeting, while I was writing this paper, I talked about the Northeast Asia more in my chapter, and I was asked to actually expand uh, the region that I cover. And I kind of uh, studied more, and my conclusion was that East Asia country and the North uh, Eastern Asia, the relationship was uh, very thin. Actually, there wasn't any Southern Way policy uh, discussed in Japan in the mid, uh, Meiji era and Taisho, early Taisho and after the World War II. And uh, there was uh, actually a Chinese revolution which uh, attracted our attention and we did not really talk about, discuss this uh, southern policy, southern advancement policy. And we did not uh, actually advance into those countries. We did not think of uh, actually invading uh, Indonesia or Java uh, for the future interests. So there was a separation of uh, East Asia and uh, Northeast Asia. But uh, this, right after the war, we paid uh, reparations to Southeast Asia because uh, of the uh, defeat in the war. Well, I would like to speak two, three more, more, two or three more, three more minutes. I would like to talk about uh, now this concept of FOIP or FOIP, 
free and open the Indo uh, Indo-Pacific. In 2016, uh, then Abe, uh, Prime Minister Abe actually used this word, but I think right after the war, this term was actually used. Development uh, in Japan will have uh, influence uh, over uh, Southeast Asia and East, uh, Northeast Asia, and this will result in the development of uh, the, uh, actual industrialization and so on, and it will have uh, influence on India and Indian region as well, region surrounding India as well. So actually, this word was often used in uh, academic societies. And Japan-India relationship deepened in uh, 2004 to 05, uh, There was uh, a deepening of the relationship. So this FOIP? Actually, so there was a strong relationship between uh, Japan and uh, India, but uh, we gave this we gave this relationship a word as FOIP. Well, NATO was created because of the threat, common uh, awareness of the threat of Russia, but FOIP cannot uh, replace uh, or become. Uh, something like that in this region, because this consists of uh, various elements. First, it's a strong Japan-U.S. alliance. Only with that that uh, we can actually exert influence uh, over this region. And another concept which is discussed often is Quad. India is a very important country. But uh, it doesn't. Uh, it has strong. Uh, uh, will for independence, and it doesn't uh, like to do something together with other countries. But uh, so we have to take this into consideration. But ASEAN, for example, there was an idea of uh, actually creating Western Pacific uh, Union, which is. Uh, similar to uh, European Union. But uh, this sort of regional union does not uh, function when there's a superpower as a member, because they're self-centered, so it's better not to include the uh, USA nor China, so that uh, equality among members will be secured, and there has to be based on uh, sound basic uh, principles. We. Uh, aim for democratization and rule of law and so on. But the great East Asian prosperity sphere did not, uh, were not equipped with these ideas. And uh, we actually went through the Pacific uh, War and uh, Indonesia, Philippi the Philippines and Vietnam, Australia, New Zealand, and if possible, Pacific Island countries. And if possible, if we can include Malaysia, Singapore, Bangladesh, if we actually get together with a so-called middle power, though I don't like the word that so, that, that would be, I think, uh, ideal. Because that's what we missed uh, before the war uh, in connecting the South and the uh, North. So I think democratization and the rule of war, uh, rule of law, should be the basic principles. Aizawa-san, Oba-san, and Takagi-san, Suzuki-san, uh, all of, with all those people, I wrote this uh, chapter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kitaoka. In fact, uh, you look back uh, historical development and trying to come up with the outlook for the future. Three speakers in session one are all famous. Therefore, I would not introduce them specifically. But needless to say, he is uh, the leading expert in uh, relationship or diplomacy of Japan. And uh, the next speaker, she has been uh, studying uh, the wide range of topics related to a Asian countries, and uh, she's going to share with us her PowerPoint. 
during Q&A, um, which is scheduled afterwards. If you have any questions, uh, you can write down questions in the Q&A section anytime you want. I'd like to select questions uh, during Q&A session. Now, without further ado, I'd like to ask um, Professor Oba. Is uh, the video on? Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Oba of the Kanagawa University, as has been already introduced. I will not uh, introduce myself. On my part, I was in charge of Chapter 6 of Volume 1 of the book that we are discussing. And the title was uh, The International Relationship from the Late Phase of Cold War to the End of Century. That is, it is after the communist regimes were born in Indochina uh, Peninsula and the end of Cold War toward the end of uh, the century. That was a period that I elaborated on in the chapter. I had to cover a wide range of issues, and therefore, that was quite a challenge. But there are three sections, and then they are divided into those uh, subsections. That's how this chapter is structured. Hope that this would take a look at that when you have a time. Now, talking about this question of the mid 1970s until the end of 1980s, what was the age uh, that was considered as the time from late cold, uh, phase of Cold War? In fact, there was a time, actually, the old issues uh, that we face in East Asia in 21st century were developed. In other words, uh, there were various uh, trends uh, that we saw in the Cold War relationship surfaced in the last uh, 10 years of 20th century. In other words, uh, there were many unsolved questions, issues after the Cold War that left intact in East Asia. And the, after the Cold War, such issues that were unsolved have changed and then became even more serious, for instance, in the uh, Korean Peninsula and Taiwan Strait. And the, when we consider the continuity uh, with the international relationship of East Asia in 21st century, and then the issues that we saw during this period could be classified into four categories. We already heard from uh, Dr. Kitaoka and also from Dr. Tanaka. In fact, uh, when we look at Northeast Asia as opposed to Southeast Asia, the, each region was somewhat dependent, independent, and therefore uh, they were not uh, the merged into one single region. But in uh, 10 years during 1990s, this region started to be viewed as a single region. In other words, I believe two regions were merged together to be transformed into a single region. And I believe such a trend still continues even today. And that was triggered by, for instance, Prime Minister Mahathir of Malaysia about EAEG concept. That is two sub-regions started to be viewed as one region because of regionalism. EAEG did not succeed, but then uh, SM plus three was born, AR, ARF and uh, APEC. The such uh, the regime started to uh, consolidate the relationship in this region. And there is another trend that is about the economic development and deepening of the economic uh, mutual dependency. The, in this chapter that I wrote together with Dr. Tanaka, I talked about the Asia as a form and development of Asia, that is, economic dependence in this region was a major factor that merged those two sub-regions. And also the rise of China and their uh, advance into 
uh, the ocean, uh, the Pacific, uh, that uh, even uh, accelerated uh, the merger of those two regions. But I would say that that is a trend that started to surface in the current century. But the, I would say that uh, the Korean Peninsula, Taiwan Strait, and South China Sea became uh, the strategic issues that would determine uh, the regional order. And also, there is another factor that is about the development from a trilateral relationship among the United States, USSR, and China into U.S.-China confrontation. Well, uh, the, this region's situation has uh, become very complicated with uh, the pluralism and uh, the China-Vietnam War or civil war in Cambodia against the backdrop of uh, the confrontation between China and the USSR, but eventually Cold War ended. Therefore, uh, the USSR lost its uh, relative importance as a major power in this region. And then came uh, the relationship between the United States and China. It first started uh, with the uh, strategic partnership and then eventually the confrontation in the context of trade, human rights, and Taiwan. A third, needless to say, the change in the relationship between Japan and China. As uh, the major economic power, Japan made a great advance, but uh, since 1990s, its economy started to stagnate while China started to uh, advance economically. And according to Baldwin and others, the new globalization uh, served as a backdrop. And in East Asia in its entirety, there was a major development. But among them, uh, the development of China was so remarkable. And therefore, the historical issues and the relationship or change in relationship between Japan and China already started uh, to surface in this, uh, during this time. Well, uh, the, the competition between Japan and China that was not uh, quite apparent in the late 20th century, yet the, during Asian currency crisis and financial crisis, we saw some signs of uh, such a competition between the two. And the competition between the two became even more apparent after the turn of century, and the, the balance between the two has been reversed and the fourth factor, that is since a late phase of Cold War toward the end of uh, the 20th century, especially after the Cold War, the East Asia started to be positioned as a part of the liberal international order. What I mean by that is the liberal political value, liberal economic, uh, the market economy, and uh, the international cooperation partnership uh, those are the main pillars of liberal international order, and East Asia was a part of that. We heard from Dr. Tanaka that uh, the, uh, there are a wide variety of different uh, political setups in East Asia, which I completely agree with. At the same time, during 1980s and 1990s in East Asia, Taiwan, Korea, the Philippines, we saw progress of democratization and then the democratization of Indonesia after Asian currency crisis. And therefore, overall, democratization in this region has made some advance, while others did not. But overall, I would say that there was an advance protection of human rights. The situation was improved compared to before, yet, together with such a progress, after that, we saw some uh, the the movement toward the reverse direction uh, in uh, the last decade or so, and thus East Asia started to develop uh, thanks to a liberal market economy. So that's a, that's when East Asian countries enjoy the benefit, and also international partnership the the was uh, promoted 
with uh, the retrogression of uh, the confrontation during the Cold War. At the same time, China started to realize that they have to respond to the uh, concern about the, the rise of them, and therefore they try to restrain themselves to some extent. And the regional issues should be dealt with regionally. That was uh, the, 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 the factor that symbolizes the regionalism in this region. And as, as we look at those four aspects during this region, now after the turn of century, what happened? In fact, uh, some of the issues that we saw before, especially after 2010, uh, that we started to see them even more apparent. I will not elaborate on that, but uh, toward the future, the international relationship, which is the basis of uh, this uh, region, uh, that is now in question. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Oba. And uh, along with Professor Takahara, they were in charge of chapter six. And this time, I have read it. And the international relations over the past year, well, the paper was written before that, but uh, they have captured uh, the great uh, trends um, towards the end in chapter six. In recent years, what is uh, focused on is uh, the retreat of democracy in Southeast Asia. And in the background, uh, there is probably uh, the influence of uh, lack of uh, emphasis on uh, democracy, so that there is the major move between US and China. And I think uh, with this kind of background, we can understand what is going on. Now, uh, Professor Takahara will take the next 10 minutes to talk about China. Professor Takahara, please. Thank you very much. Well, myself and uh, Professor Ova uh, was uh, in charge of Chapter 6, and she uh, wrote the majority. So inclusive of the uh, report today, uh, you could say I'm an add-on, but uh, China uh, was on the rise, and that is uh, clear. And the trend of China is going to have clearly a major impact on the history of the region. So I would like to add some points about China. After the 80s, if I talk about China, we can say that uh, what is impressive is uh, their uh, great uh, growth. And uh, in the textbooks of world history, uh, the rapid uh, realization of growth will be indicated, especially from the 90s or 1992. And then uh, there's been the rise in the standard of living, which uh, was promoted at a very quick pace. And that in itself was a major event. And also in parallel with that, or uh, the reason for that, why is it that uh, this uh, speedy growth was possible? There is the ideology and uh, breaking free from it, and uh, people's uh, wishes, you could say, their desires were set free. And so the bold uh, neglect of the uh, ideology, well, that was possible because, of course, uh, there was Perestroika and Gorbachev, uh, but uh, in 1991, the Communist Party in the Soviet Union disappeared. And I think uh, that uh, was, uh, you could say, one uh, obstacle that was removed. And after 1992, then Zhao Pin made an appeal for the opening up and reform. And uh, Kim Il-sung and Castro, well, some complained. But uh, they were ignored, and the reform and opening up uh, could be promoted. And so I think uh, the, the situation of uh, Soviet communists uh, disappearing is very big. 
and then there was uh, large-scale uh, political movements which were suspended although there were some small-scale ones and then they could go on with reform and opening up that is uh, to have activities that prioritize the economy and uh, they could uh, focus on the economic growth so externally if we think about the external relationship Within the existing international order, uh, there was uh, stability and prosperity and under peace, uh, as uh, mentioned by Dr. Tanaka. And also after the 1990s, uh, globalization accelerated and uh, the rise of China, you could say, had uh, some uh, interaction. And Japan relatively quickly and, uh, knew the potential of the Chinese market and uh, becomes involved and uh, at the end of the 1970s when China started economic exchange uh, it uh, depended on Japan and also the overseas Chinese and uh, especially the overseas Chinese living in Southeast Asia and then after 1992 Western capital, although there are some exceptions, Western capital, you could say, discovered China and so that money and technology and people came into China. And of course, that was a major driver of the development of China. So, but still, it's not just the light, there's also the aspects of shadow. That is, uh, society becomes more fluid, the gaps in society grow bigger, and there's an emphasis on money and decay of ethics and morals. I think you all know about that. And also, the momentum for the political reform existed in the 80s, but as you know, in 1989, there's the second uh, Tiananmen incident or the 6-4 incident so that uh, the political reform move it diminishes and uh, you have a situation where the major challenge is left undone. So the socialist market economy uh, is uh, used by the uh, single party and uh, you have the present situation where the market uh, uh, economy is growing. And uh, I don't think that the cadre have such a view. So when and what process uh, was this change uh, occurring and how will it end up? Well, no one knows. And also, it's possible that this process could accompany violence and so people don't want to think about it. It's like uh, Japan and earthquakes. Uh, Japanese people don't want to think about earthquakes, although it's going to occur someday. I think that's the same for China. So you have uh, China, which has become so strong, and uh, are they going to enhance the challenge against the international order? That is a source of worry. But in the past, the show in line, in the 19, beginning of the 1970s, uh, Ameri met American researcher uh, delegation, and uh, uh, this is before uh, the normalization of ties. Uh, so these were a group of young uh, pro-Chinese researchers, and uh, uh, do you think China will become hegemonic? Uh, a young female researcher was asked, and the researcher said no. Uh, apparently, and uh, Cho and Lai answered, "Well, you never know, and if it if China in the future becomes hegemonic, uh, you have to oppose." And please say that Cho and Lai was also opposed, and uh, people clapped. So I think uh, that is a real episode. And China, which gained power, what is it aiming for, and how is it going to behave? We have been uh, watching uh, these changes. The other story, that is, we wrote about history, the modern history, but we have to be careful. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party knows that uh, uh, history is politics, and they often rewrite history. And China, historically, traditionally, 
is where uh, the victor writes history, and you have to be very careful. For example, uh, without knowing it, this opening up began in 1978. Uh, we now think in this way. Many people think so still. But uh, if you question yourself, why is it that you think in that way? If you ask yourself that question, it's because everyone is saying so. And why is everyone saying so? Well, it's because the Chinese Communist Party is saying so. So if you think uh, very simply and do a check, then this reform and opening up, the meaning is not very clear. And so there are many things like that. People are very weak, and uh, when they are told the same thing over and over, then your brain becomes brainwashed uh, in that narrative. And recently what I'm focusing on is Hua Guofen, after Mao Zedong, he was nominated. And then uh, there was the power struggle. And then in 1981, he is uh, he leaves the post of the uh, president. And uh, this year is the 100th year since his uh, birthday. And how is he going to be described in the history written by Xi Jinping's party? because there were two crimes. One is the two all. In other words, all is Mao Zedong's uh, decision, and that has to be the basis in which to judge what is right or wrong. That's what he said, and that's not right. And the other crime is uh, deification or personality cult. And uh, that is without with uh, 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 hi about himself. His photo was placed uh, next to Mao Zedong, and uh, this year, uh, well, there's going to be the hundredth anniversary of uh, the Communist Party, and there is uh, much learning uh, being promoted. And this is not uh, being uh, discussed because uh, Xi Jinping right now is doing the same thing. But people remember what happened. Those who were alive at the time remember, or those who had received education a little while ago remember this. So uh, in the political struggle, what is this symbol? How is the symbol going to be uh, used? And uh, how is uh, Deng Xiaoping going to be uh, uh, described? He denied the cultural revolution, and uh, he introduced collective leadership, saying that power should not be focused on one person, but that is happening now. So Deng Xiaoping and Hua Guofen before that, uh, what kind of discussion is going to take place going forward? That will be one key point to predict uh, the future uh, Xi Jinping China. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Takahara, for the wonderful talk. And uh, uh, we looked at the modern awareness and the history, and I think you raised many points. And I think we have about 30 minutes or so, and so we have received some questions. And uh, we would have the panelists answer, or if there are points to add by other panelists, uh, that is also possible. And uh, in 1989, there was the major change, as you indicated in the book, that is uh, very important. And the uh, Tiananmen incident was a major transition point. And uh, I read chapter six, and that's what I felt very strongly, that is the, was the Soviet factor that uh, you mentioned, that is uh, at the end of the uh, uh, China-Soviet uh, confrontation and the Soviet-US uh, confrontation. And the worsening of the image by Japan toward China, uh, when we think about that, in 1992, there was the emperor's visit to China. And this was, you could say, the peak of uh, Japan-China uh, 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 friendship. 
And in Chapter 6, after the Cold War, the 30 years um, is reviewed, and uh, it was a good opportunity to review the past three decades. And Professor Kitaoka talked about uh, Indo-Pacific uh, too, and that is uh, pre-war uh, Japanese uh, diplomatic strategy. That is, you have the Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia, and uh, how can you come up with an integrated strategy? Uh, you could say that uh, this was explored by Japan pre-war, and they couldn't come up with an answer. And Professor Kita Oka talked about the Western Pacific Union, and Japan took the lead in, in uh, this Indo-Pacific uh, uh, concept. I think that was being suggested. And so there aren't that many questions uh, uh, submitted as yet, but uh, during, if you could write in your question uh, in the Q&A, then uh, we will ask the panelists. This is a good opportunity. So you can ask questions to other speakers. And uh, if uh, 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 Professor Kitaoka, you, you, would you like to make a comment for one or two minutes on other speakers' speeches? Well, I spent uh, more than the time allocated to myself. In Meiji era, mid Meiji era, Southern uh, advancement uh, theory was actually discussed. But because of the tension between Japan and Russia, uh, we paid more at attention to the interests we can obtain in uh, that region. And there was a Chinese revolution. Which was actually, so the uh, private sector's uh, actually discussion on southern policy was uh, act uh, was not advanced because of these external issues. And what I said in the third part of my chapter was that in relation with Southeast Asia, as I said, started with the paying reparations and then human resource development help and the establishment of a Coast Guard system, like JICA helped that. And the core of democratization is the rule of law. That is my view. One day, all of a sudden, a secret police visit you and you will be taken away. That's the worst dream, worst nightmare. So rule of law is important. And also, a preparedness for uh, disasters is uh, really important in East Asia because in the Philippines and in other uh, countries, there are uh, frequent uh, disasters. So we just respect this group called ASEAN, but uh, they are based on principle of uh, non-interference in domestic affairs, so they cannot uh, make any uh, movement, many actions they cannot uh, take any actions against uh, China. So I think we should strengthen the relationship uh, between Japan and the key players of ASEAN and Australia. Thank you very much, Mr. Kita uh, Professor Kitaoka. Uh, uh, Professor Ova, any comments? Dr. Ova? Thank you. I don't have much to comment on, but as I have been writing this article, especially the confrontation between China and Russia was the topic that I learned a lot after the end of Cold War. And then USSR regime uh, fell, and the uh, significance of that was quite important after hearing from Dr. Takahara. So that's what I learned a lot. And also, the Northeast Asia, as opposed to Southeast Asia, those two regions used to be driven by different logics, 
they were treated in separate regions and eventually they were merged in or converged into one. Looking at the that process from different topics, in fact, uh, the, as Dr. Kitaoka said, uh, the during the Pacific War, uh, the military intention to advance north and south, and uh, the advance toward the north was uh, the more important. And the reason is because for Japan, uh, when uh, we consider the advance into north and south, the distance was quite different. The, those regions uh, that were subject to advance into north, uh, the, uh, that were geographically close compared to Southeast Asia. In other words, Southeast Asia actually includes a wide range of geographical region. And uh, that uh, region, which is so vast, eventually started to be viewed as one region started with the uh, economic development and uh, the globalization with expansion of the uh, international production network and together with that China grew and then came regionalism and since the turn of the century as I mentioned earlier China viewed at South China Sea as well as East China Sea and the presence of China there started to be viewed as a major threat. And that also the, the, the triggered uh, the, uh, the Southeast Asia to act as a single region. And therefore, the, it was a turning point that we experienced since the end of Cold War until the turn of the century. There were many issues. Some resolved, the others not which eventually uh, trans transformed this region into one. Thank you. Thank you. P Professor Takahara, if you'd like to supplement what you have said or questions to other speakers. In one of the questions, I think uh, five people asked questions to address to Professor Takahara. Can I read them? And you don't have to answer all the questions, but uh, you can actually uh, take some of them. The first ones, Tomoko Takahashi, Japan and others, especially the West. There was a gap to be aware of uh, globalism and threat of China. In, uh, actually, there was a... So, so the West uh, actually paid attention to this uh, threat of China uh, and very recently. And Mr. Ueda, there's a question to Professor Takashi. Actually, if uh, China will resume uh, political uh, reforms, wh where is the uh, beginning of this, uh, the, the, that uh, movement? And another question. When you say a reform and open door policy, when did it start and when did it end? And the current the Xi administration, is it the holding flag for that the policy? And I was very much interested in the uh, change, historical change of China, a Chinese uh, Communist Party from 1978, uh, actually a uh, political reform was uh, started. That's how the Communist Party uh, claimed. But what is the reason for that? And uh, actually disparity between the rich and the poor is uh, soaring, and they seem to actually uphold uh, Confucianism. But what about the moral and the view in the leadership. Uh, I think I wonder that uh, the leadership's uh, view is quite different from Confucianism, and this, all these are actually uh, very heavy issues. It takes one hour to answer all these questions. But because of the time constraint, you can just uh, uh, pick up some questions and answer. Yes, I will be succinct. First, uh, Takahashi-san's question. There's a uh, time gap uh, between becoming awareness of the threat of uh, China between Japan and the West. 
uh, the Western countries started to think about seriously. For example, Europe was uh, uh, concerned about the advancement to uh, Africa by China. They actually uh, scientifically and uh, industrial way actually coming to the European spheres. And the USA, there was uh, some interference to the naval uh, ships, and there was some action, and that started uh, them becoming uh, aware of this threat. And uh, Mr. Weta, when there's a confusion in society, I think uh, there has to be a, created a mechanism to uh, actually create a system where they can respect the multiple views and diverse views. I think that sort of mechanism, that sort of discussion might take place. And there's now labor industrial uh, strife in uh, China. So when there are problems uh, internally, uh, there might be a voice from the people that uh, reform is uh, necessary. And when uh, open door policy and reform started, it depends. Chinese uh, uh, Communist Party re-actually re wrote this history. Uh, this was the 1978 uh, December, a third plenary session. And that was the major change uh, to uh, policy, open door policy. But that was not it. But that's what the communists uh, wrote, the history again, because uh, Tao Xiangping said that he became the supreme leader. He wanted to appeal that. So that is why he wrote the uh, history. What is reform and open door policy according to my definition? This, is a sim this was a symbol of the prestige and authority of Deng Xiaoping. That is why uh, Xi, Xu, uh, Xu, Xu, Xu didn't want to use this word, and uh, Hu Jintao actually used uh, this word. So now, according to the official history, it started from 78, but that word was not used at that time. Only in 1984, it was actually put on a, a national gazette, but we forgot about it. We also forget, we tend to forget things, so it's an interesting point. And Confucianism, Hu Jintao administration, uh, the publicity department of the party actually used the moral education using Confucianism, but it stopped in the middle. I think there is an uh, internal strife between the parties, between the parties group which should use Confucianism and which do not like it. Mao Zedong actually thought uh, that the Confuci Confuci Confucius was a symbol of feudalism and did not uh, actually uh, respect it. So there is a group of uh, people who actually advocate Confucianism and those who do not, and there's an internal strike between the two. Well, thank you very much. Well, because there is a much interest in China, there many of the questions were raised about China, but I realize that uh, not all of them uh, we're asking question of Dr. Takahara, but Dr. Kitaoka, Dr. Ooba, if you are willing to answer some of the questions or if you have any comments on questions that are of your interest. And also there was a question about India, the importance of India in East Asia and ASEAN and the importance of Japan-India relationship and also the rule of law. If you can comment on that, Dr. Kitaoka and Dr. Oba. Yes, uh, there are some points that I'd like to make. It was in 2008 uh, that, that I started to uh, be concerned about the change in policy by China. It was around uh, June 2008 that I started to sense the change in the uh, atmosphere. But in the previous year, uh, in May, 
Hu Jintao came to Japan and issued a joint statement together with then Prime Minister Fukuda. Uh, that was uh, quite a favorable statement, and yet I assume that it was not popular domestically. And uh, then uh, there was uh, the Beijing Olympic Games, which was quite successful, and therefore that was a time when uh, China started to be uh, more radical, so to speak. In essence, uh, the sometimes uh, the leaders might say no uh, to uh, the uh, uh, the interest of the people. But uh, yet, there is a term that is imposed on leaders, and yet uh, the it was now abolished. And about the rule of law, the question is raised by Mr. Furusawa. The rule of law means that even uh, the leaders are under the, uh, the rule of law. Well, uh, although there is a legal system in China, the leaders are not abide by the laws, and therefore I would say that the rule of law would not apply to China and India. Well, I would say that there are two major schools of theories, whether the uh, particular country is the center of the universe or whether the, uh, the it is not. And I would say that uh, the we ascribe to uh, the a theory of not the center of the universe, well, as in the case of India, sometimes it appears that they tend to consider themselves as the center of the universe. Of course, we are doing uh, getting along with India, and yet the the give and take in principle, like for instance, in two thousand four and five, when there was a Security Council reform. The United States used to state that Japan uh, was qualified to be the uh, the 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 next uh, the permanent uh, the the member of the Security Council. But it was around that time that uh, the United States started to include India in that list as well, and that's when India became more uh, expansionist, so to speak, in terms of their policies, including nuclear power development or nuclear development. Therefore. Of course, we have to consider the support and a good relationship with them, yet we don't want to see the a kind of conflict with neighboring countries. The stable prosperity and development of India is something that we want to support because that would also be the benefit for us, but we should not hold much expectation to them. That's my impression. And uh, there is one more point that I'd like to make. This is going to be the last. The, the question was raised about the advance into north rather than advance into south in, uh, the, during the war. Well, the, the reason is because Japan wanted to advance toward the north. You know that the army was uh, strong politically in Japan back then, and for many years. They, they used to focus on Hokkaido, and uh, that tradition seems to be still maintained even today. In other words, uh, we can't uh, just criticize uh, the the Japan before the war, the reason why uh, Japan advanced toward the south was uh, to uh, cut down the uh, support line to Chiang Kai-shek. And as a part of that, uh, they advanced to Burma. But uh, yet, army was al always interested in the north, while the Navy was only interested in getting more budget. And then the Minister of Foreign Affairs, they were well disciplined, they wanted to behave well, and uh, as a result of those three factors, it, the Japan did not advance too aggressively toward the south. Thank you very much, Dr. Kitaoka. Now, Dr. Oba, if you have any points to make uh, from your point of view. Thank you very much. In this chapter, uh, the I consider some of the sections require a more of the elaboration for United States in the uh, East Asia. The role that has been played by the United States should have been discussed as a part of this chapter. Although we extensively discussed the relationship between the United States and China, yet 
the North Korea and Korean Peninsula, and the United States is discussed to some extent, and also the security regime between Japan and the United States. The United States is also referred to, but in this uh, region, for instance, I mentioned about the liberal international order, the role that has been played by the United States, I think that should have been also elaborated on that because that is quite important. What we are seeing right now, of course, uh, that relates to the rise of China. That is because uh, we are more concerned about the which is going to be the major driver, the leader of the order, and uh, the order uh, from the end of Cold War until the end of century uh, has been supported by who? That should be more extensively discussed, especially the role of the United States. And that's what should be elaborated on more. Needless to say, the United States is geographically uh, apart from East Asia, yet the when it comes to the formation of the order in East Asia, the United States has been playing an important role. And in view of that, what kind of sentiment that this region used to have and what kind of contradiction between the two and how it has surfaced uh, since the beginning of the 21st century, that should be more explicitly discussed. And based upon my expertise uh, from the point of view of regionalism, well, uh, during that time, the, the regionalism was more peaceful. If there is a place for gathering, then that will be just important to gather those countries in this region. And that was considered as a symbol of the international cooperation and partnership. But more recently, CPTPP and RCEP were developed against the backdrop of a wide variety of discussions. That is, uh, the when notable countries and states want to do something together, that is because uh, they consider it as an important tool uh, to represent their interest, and therefore the regionalism started to be viewed uh, more strategically, and therefore rather than cooperation and partnership, for the sake of competition, the regionalism started to embody that concept. And what we discuss in this chapter is uh, the period before that, and since 2010, I believe regionalism has become more actively pursued. At the same time, it is being transformed into something that includes competition. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Oba. And our time is limited, and uh, we have seven more minutes. So finally, two minutes each, if you could give a wrap up or keep Professor uh, Kitaoka and Professor Takahara, uh, some there have been some specific questions uh, raised to you. So, if using the two minutes you wish to make a summary or add some points, that's fine too. So, Professor Kitaoka first. If you could unmute, please. As uh, Dr. Tanaka said, how to maintain peace in this area is a very important issue because without peace, uh, things would break down. So you have Taiwan, which is a source of anxiety. And I think that China basically is militarily very cautious. So unless it believes that it can win easily, it's not going to make a move. So put another way, I think that uh, raising security capability to the extent that it will not provoke China will be necessary. That's one point. And uh, I think that will be important in considering ties with India because India often says uh, that uh, Japan is not uh, making enough effort. And uh, I would like to answer one thing about the view of history. Uh, that is a uh, memorial uh, in place of Yasukuni, it was the question. And actually, I think that would, if that were possible, that would be good too. And there's also uh, the uh, separation of the so-called Class A war criminals. 
and uh, that might uh, work too. But uh, uh, if you do that, when we think about uh, Japan and China relation and Japan Korea relations, think, will it have a big effect? Well, maybe not, because uh, one after another there are difficult issues, and these are issues that are very divisive in Japan. And rather than uh, exert so much energy there, maybe other things can be done. Professor Hosoya, you're doing uh, something like that, that is uh, about the succession of the next emperor. I think uh, that is m more important for Japan. And we could make an uh, alternative facility, but, uh, 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 well, uh, they're still going to talk about what Japan did during the war. So I think what is important and uh, in economy, I think uh, Japan has to become uh, vitalized, and I think reinforcing uh, the e economic capability is most important in maintaining peace. Thank you very much. Professor Oba, please. Please unmute. Thank you very much. So when we think about East Asia within Japan, the interest tends to focus on Northeast Asia, but the importance of Southeast Asia is increasing, and it's always been important. From the perspective of Southeast Asia, after the Cold War, there's the ASEAN 10, and the Southeast Asia as a whole is uh, covered by ASEAN. And also, uh, the Southeast Asian nations and ASEAN are almost synonymous, and that happens uh, during this period of time. So the cooperation of ASEAN, well, this time we're looking at the East Asian history as a whole, so it's not uh, taken up in a major way, but uh, towards the community formation, well, that will be, that will becomes more fulfilled after the Cold War and the development of Southeast Asia and uh, extraterritorial uh, countries also uh, being involved is during this stage. So from the perspective of Southeast Asia, this was a very important time in history. And I think I've said it all, so I'd like to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Oba. And finally, Professor Takahara, please. Uh, let me be short. One thing, as uh, Professor Oba said, uh, that is regionalism, specifically how regional frameworks are constructed. I think there are two major paths. One is to respond to globalization. In other words, there are networks and uh, goods will travel those networks. And there are things that you want to have uh, on the network and not. There's, for example, negative things like COVID-19 and drugs. So the framework to suppress that uh, is made by uh, uh, governments and uh, networks are made in your region. You have such geographic framework. The other is what is strategic. For example, you have China fighting with the U.S., but you want to secure allies. So around you, you build frameworks and you secure your uh, allies. So the latter one is emphasized right now, especially how China will respond to the U.S.-China uh, confrontation uh, through frameworks. And also there was a question at the end. Uh, basically, people in China want to live in a safe and affluent society, and so long that is met, there is still I think uh, the uh, be better good. And so uh, thank you, Professor T Takahara. And uh, all the experts are accustomed to webinars, and I think that you are very concise so that uh, we could end session one on time. And there were many good insights uh, made. And I think uh, some of the issues will be linked to sessions two and three. And it is about uh, Northeast Asia and also Southeast Asia. We will be discussing those areas. After a 10 minute break, we will go on to session two. And 
to the uh, three uh, speakers. Thank you very much for the meaningful discussion. And I would also like to thank uh, the uh, very important questions that you submitted. So uh, session one will now come to an end. Thank you very much.